and thinking about what to teach on today and kind of still trying to stay in line with the flow of things from last week. I settled on the question, did Jesus really have to die for our sin? And obviously, I mean, the easy question is, or the easy answer is yes, but you have to, you have to have spent time in the word and you have to have a relationship to even know what that would mean or why. And so I'm not going to go on the assumption that everybody knows that. Um, there had to be a sacrifice for sin, and we see that right out of the gate, right in Genesis chapter 3. So I think we'll start there, and we're just going to kind of chase this theme throughout the entire Bible as much as we can. And maybe it'll... Maybe it'll be something that's extended into tomorrow, or maybe there'll be something more specific, but still along the same lines. I'm not sure yet, but anyhow. So Genesis chapter 3 is basically the fall of man. We don't know how long Adam and Eve were actually in the garden. Um, my guess is not very long. There's no children before this, um, so I, I would tend to think it probably happened fairly quickly. There's a few different characters in this, in this particular situation, but they are, they are set in the garden after creation is done. This is where they have communion with God. They, they have... Um, they have things to do. They're supposed to tend the garden. So it's not like, you know, it's just lounge around all the time and, and do nothing. They were, they had work to do even, even in a time when things were still perfect. Uh, so you want to keep that in mind also when you're thinking about these stories and maybe other questions that you would have after the fall, uh, the condition of, of men at this time is different than what we have now, but we're not going to get into all that. I could get sidetracked by that and go on to everything all night, but we're not going to do that. So anyways, Genesis chapter 3. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. <clears throat> then the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the woman saw the tree, or saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise, so she took of it, or took of its fr uh, fruit and ate. She also gave her husband, or gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard <clears throat> the sound of the the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I, hear, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, uh, commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman whom you gave me to, to be with me, she, she gave me uh, of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, 
and you shall eat dust all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall uh, bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then at, to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Curse is the ground for your sake. In toil you should eat of it <clears throat> all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field, and in the sweet, or I'm sorry, in the sweat of your face you shall uh, eat bread uh, till you uh, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And Adam called his wife wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Also for Adam and his wife the Lord made tunics of skin, and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man is has become like one of us. To know good and evil, and now lest he be put out, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent out of the garden, <clears throat> sent him out of the garden of Eden uh, to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of east of the garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way. To guard the way to the tree of life. All right, so they're put in the garden, and actually, if you get back to the to the close of chapter two, when they're put in the garden after they're made into this special place, they're told not to eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because if they eat it, or in the day that they eat it, God told them you're going to die. That's the one rule he had. Just one rule. You know, I think sometimes we like to think that if we didn't have as many rules, if there wasn't so much right and so much wrong, then we would get it right. And in fact, if you look at the way society is going now, that is the trend. We're trying to blur the lines and everything so that there is no right and no wrong. It started some years ago with the whole idea that there was no absolute truth. There was no right, no wrong. Everything is relative. Now nothing's relative at all. Now they just want to call it whatever they want to call it. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it's sexual orientation. It doesn't matter. It, it, it just doesn't matter what it is. We want to make everything blurry. We want to make everything indistinguishable. And we're going to pay for that. And I, I think... Maybe God will let this run long enough so that we'll begin to pay for the consequences of our own decision first before we pay for the judgment or pay with the judgment from him for not being able to tolerate sin. This will run a this will run a cycle. He may very well let us experience this for a little while. But I think we're also to the point where you see in Genesis chapter 6 where God says I, I I will not strive with man much longer. You know, that was his attitude toward Noah. When you go from this here and, and you begin to read through the genealogies of Cain and, and, and Seth after, after Cain kills Abel. And some of the, the ways that they begin to justify their own actions. You know, Cain tries to justify himself as far as killing Abel, um, he decides that the, whatever God was going to do to him was going to be too much to answer for, even though he's, he's killed his brother. And so God just marks him and makes him a, a, a wanderer and, and puts the mark on him so that nobody will touch him, nobody will kill him, nobody's going to come with vengeance. And you get a couple of generations past him and you find that there's a man there who goes out and kills a man. And he says, you know, it, was, it wasn't legal to kill Cain. And, and so it's not going to be legal to kill me either. And, and God protected Cain. Certainly then nobody should touch me for what I've done. 
and that's kind of how it goes. We look at we look at other people and we see that they think that or we think that they're getting away with something. Their punishment or their consequence wasn't really that bad, so ours also should not be very bad. It should be no more than what they got, but actually because we are more acceptable than we were when that person did what they did, now our consequence should be even less. And that leads us into this downward spiral of where we're at now where we can't make up our mind about anything, about what is right and what is wrong. We can't make up our mind about who we are. We're, we're, we've tried to make things so politically correct we can barely talk anymore without offending anybody. And and we're so worried about offending anybody that, you know, we stay in specific little circles and and... Believe me, it's having its desired effect on on our society that those who have designed it and the one who inspired it being the same person who spoke to Eve here, it, it's having its desired effect. It's separating people from one another. And and it's isolating people when that's not what we're meant to do. We're not we're not meant to be isolated. In fact, when God made Adam, that was the only thing that he said is not good. It's not good for a man to be alone. And so he, he, he made Eve from man and, and begins mankind with these two people. Well, the, the whole ploy here is to try to separate and to try to diminish. And he, first you separate from God and then you start separating from one another. And we become isolated and we become one and we're individuals and we get to make up our own identities and our own language. And it's just, it gets, it's getting ridiculous. It is literally the enemy trying to destroy that which God made and said was good. And, and it's like, he's trying to just take it back in reverse to, in an effort to to put us all basically in the ground alone. So we see right away, and in most of what we what we focused on last week was the Word of God itself, what it said, and, and we ended with revival and what did godly what does godly revival actually look like? And we focused on Nehemiah. In the beginning of the week, we talked about a lot, or I talked a lot about the attack on the Bible. And these three chapters that that are right here, especially the one that I just talked about, are really under fire right now. And, and it doesn't matter. You don't have to be in a secular college. You don't have to be um, in a secular job. You can be in a church and they don't believe this. You can be in a Christian college, supposed Christian college, and they're teaching that this isn't true, that this didn't happen, that God just took evolution and he used it to bring man to where he's at, and that he just started the Big Bang, he started with the Big Bang, he just let it go, and it's, and it's turned into this, and, and they might insinuate that he directed it as it went but he still used evolution and they want to say that evolution is undeniable and that's that's in the in the uh, christian schools at all levels that is now from the pulpits in america that god used evolution and not really six days of creation the problem is you take away this story, you take away original sin. And even atheists are pointing this out. They have no respect for uh, theistic evolutionists. They have much more respect for the, for the people who are staying, standing on, their, on the word of God and saying, no, this is what was written, this is what it is, and going through and taking the time to study it out and learn what God really said and what God really meant. The atheists actually have more respect for them and are more willing to talk with them and have dialogue, even though it's usually debate, with them than they are with the theistic evolutionists. They look at them as though they are just compromised 
and they've taken their ability to even uh, get to salvation and they've minimized it so much that it's it's just it's not even there anymore. The, they are warning the theistic evolutionists you can't you can't do that. I was blown away by that when I was looking up a, a particular professor that I heard about and and found out an organization that he was with that is a theistic evolution organization and they do a lot of they got a website and they do a lot of articles and that kind of thing and there was a prominent atheist that likes to debate creationists and he was he was targeting them and said this is ridiculous you can't you can't do that that you've minimized yourself already you you've thrown away original man and original sin you have no argument now and he basically he was calling them an atheist it, it really almost mockingly saying you don't even know what you believe and and part of that is what has inspired this every day through the week thing for me is that we just we don't know what we believe anymore and because i believe that the time is so short and before jesus comes that we need to do something like this every day to get the word out and so that's you know as long as we're going to do it this is what i'm going to do and and we'll take issues we'll take questions we'll take whatever that we can and we'll chase them down in the word of God and see what God says because it's my heart that people would know and understand what it truly means to be a Christian. And so that's why I started with God's word last week, that, that we need to believe this. And I guess really this is more designed for those who are on the fringe of being a Christian or, or already have been in the church but really are not grounded in the word of God. They're not getting good, solid Bible teaching. They're not getting sound doctrine. And that is important to know what we believe. We're told that we're told to know what we believe and to be ready in season and out of season to give a reason for what you believe. And because we didn't do that, because we didn't educate enough, we now have people graduating from seminaries. We have people teaching seminaries and we, the, the ones who are graduating from the seminaries are worse than the ones who are teaching the seminaries. They're all compromised all the way across. And the older generations who were solid are passing away. Their influence will be minimized to whatever we have on video or on recording of some sort to be able to keep putting the word out so you have Satan now and it's the same story it's the same story he uses now in verse 1 he says has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree in the garden so he's going to question what God says and he's going to twist what God says Because he didn't, God didn't say, you shall not eat of every tree in the garden. He said, you shall eat of every tree in the garden except one. This makes it sound like God has limited them to all of the trees in the garden or just more than one. Like he didn't identify just one tree. Now, again, if you look back into, into chapter 2 there, uh, starting with verse 15, says, Then the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you, sh you may freely eat. That's what he actually said. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And he said that to Adam before he created Eve. So Eve's answers likely came from Adam. Now, as parents, we, we've gone and maybe exaggerated some instruction to our children to keep them from doing something. How many times are, I know I've, I've done this, don't, don't look at it. Don't just, don't pick that thing up. Don't touch it. 
Don't look at it. Don't even go anywhere near it. Just stay away from it. If you do that, you know, don't don't even look at it. So we don't even want our kids to even enjoy looking at something they want to look at. And we we've we pushed it way away. And I'm I kind of think that maybe because of Eve's answer here that maybe Adam had done that. Say, listen, don't don't even touch it. Don't eat from it. But if we don't touch it, then we don't eat from it. You, you can't eat from it if you don't touch it. And then cuz if we do that, we're going to die. And Eve takes that to say, all right, well, we don't eat from it. We don't touch it because if we do that, if we even touch it, we're going to die. And maybe Adam was just so smart to say, listen, we're going to be tempted by this. If we grab a hold of that fruit to even see how it's going to feel, we're going to be we're going to be more tempted to, to take the next step that is going to kill us and that we're going to we're going to eat it. And I've certainly used that kind of reasoning with people and, and with kids especially. Listen, if you if you touch, if you say yes, if you try to get to see how close you're gonna you can get to something without getting burned, eventually you're gonna get burned. You're gonna go too far. You're you're gonna say things you wish you could take back. You're going to, you know, participate in in actions and in, in behaviors that you're going to wish you hadn't. So just stay away. So we see the same, we see the serpent. He's twisted what God has said. And Eve, Eve's kind of gone along with it. But she says, no, we can, we can eat of the trees of the garden. We just we can't mess with this one. Now, this one is set in the midst of the garden, but so is the tree of life. And I, I personally think that every time they went to the tree of life to eat from it, they had to at least be, they were at least in a place where they could see the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Every time they went to the tree of life, they had to choose to not go to the other one. One would bring life, one would bring death. God has said even concerning his word in Deuteronomy chapter 30 with verse 19, Moses is, is giving his last instructions to, to Israel before he goes away and, and he talks about the things that God has given him to, to give and relay to Israel as instruction and he says to them, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. That you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, that you may cling to him. For he is your life and the strength of your days. And that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. And, and Moses is saying there, you have a choice. I have set before you today life and death. In God's word, you have a choice. You obey, it takes you to life. You reject it, it's the way that leads to death. It hasn't changed. Not from, from the garden. Not to today. James tells us in James chapter 1, I've got so many things sticking out of here, I can't find the right one. There we go. James chapter 1 verse 14, in talking about sin and how we get into sin, how we find sin, it says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire is con has conceived, it brings forth sin, or it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Listen, it, we each choose this every day. 
We choose right, we choose wrong. We choose life or we choose death. And too many people are afraid to say that now. Too many pastors are afraid to say that. This is a life and death issue. It's not a feel-good issue. You know, they, they've minimized, they started off with minimizing the consequence of sin. They stopped saying that it leads to death. And now there's just no consequence at all. Many of them will say that there's no hell. To say that is to say you can't trust Jesus. Jesus describes hell over and over again. On Sunday morning, we've, we've been going through Matthew, and we're in 24 and 25, and a couple of different times he's described what it means to be put out from him, to end up in a place where there's weeping and, and gnashing of teeth, to be put in the outer darkness. And it's a description of eternity, and it's, it's a place that that never does. That never stops. So when God told Adam, listen, if you eat from this tree, you're going to die. We look at this and he didn't just drop dead right then when he did it. He'd say, well, see, you know, God kind of misled a little bit there, didn't he? No, Adam began to deteriorate right now. He began to shed skin cells right then and it didn't stop with Adam it went out through all of creation you know, it, we <laughs> all of these chairs that have had people sit in them we leave a little bit of ourselves behind everywhere we go you know it, it's it's actually kind of gross if you think about it too much so don't but We begin to die. Adam began to die right away. God didn't just reset everything. He didn't say, all right, you're just back to dust. We'll pile you back up, breathe new life into you, and start all over again. Then he wouldn't have been a truthful God. He said, you're going you're gonna to die. But we know that he already knew this was going to happen. You ever watch those, those shows where a computer runs a program to try to see an outcome of an event? And they run a program and then they run it again and then they run it again and they run it again. And I think it was back in the 80s. There was a movie called War Games. I think that's what it was. And... The whole point was the mutual destruction of basically the entire planet. And every scenario the computer ran, and the computer was, you know, running out of control, every, every scenario it ran, everybody died. You know, and the way to get it to stop was it began to, to the, the kid got it to, to start playing tic-tac-toe. And there was no outcome that would win. And it, and it ended up being able to shut down the computer. I don't remember all the details of it, but um, you wonder if, if and, and listen, God didn't sit there and just play with a bunch of scenarios and say, well, let's try this one. Oh, let's try this one. Let's try. No, in his um, omniscience, in his ability to know everything and all knowing God, he knew this was what was going to happen. And yet he created Adam anyways. And if you look in Revelation chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, Jesus is referred to as the lamb. He, he's seen as the lamb as though he was had been slain. There's a scroll there with all these, these seven seals on it, and nobody's worthy to take the scroll. Nobody can grab a hold of it. Nobody can open up this scroll. And then John turns and he sees... He sees Jesus with the scroll and he sees him as a lamb who has been slain. 
In Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, it tells us that that we need to be found in the Lamb's book of, or have our names written in the book of life or the book of the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. Jesus knew what he would do on the cross even before let there be light. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God had this little conference within himself. The three persons in said, this is what we're going to do. This is how they're going to blow it. This is how we're going to redeem them. But why would he do that? Why wouldn't he just make us perfect, take out that free will? Because that's what it is, the ability to choose. Why would he do that? Well, if you can't choose, then all he has is a bunch of robots running around. There's no relationship there. You don't want to be in a relationship with somebody who just loves you because you tell them to. That's not love. You want them to choose to love you. If they just do it because you tell them they have to, then they're just they're just your slave. There's no real love there. They're just whatever you say. And and they haven't chosen you back. God chose us. He chose us from, well, in Ephesians tells us before the foundations of the world that he chose us. And because he did that, we have an opportunity to choose him back. Now, Romans chapter 8, it also tells us that those who he foreknew, he also predestined. And those who he predestined, he called. I can only, I can only see that as he, he knew before, again, before the foundations of the world. In his foreknowledge, he knew who would accept him. People don't like that. They want you to land on one side or the other. You either have to be all free will or you have to be all sovereignty of God and there is no choice. But the way that reads, and since the Bible teaches both sovereignty of God and free will of man, they have to work together somehow. It's not a contradiction. The best way I can explain that is that from God's perspective, it's him. It's his sovereignty. He knows. He knew beforehand. And so he chose and he called and he, and he made sure the destination of those who would choose him from our perspective we don't know that from our perspective we have no idea if we're called or or if we are chosen or not until we choose him then we know then we will get into his word and we begin to read and we find out you know what he had already chosen me and i chose him there's an interaction here I I chose to take the gift he offered. Grace. I chose to take redemption rather than to reject it. Because he he does. He redeems us. He paid the price. The first sacrifice, and it called for sacrifice, sin, to continue on with this life, called for a sacrifice. To be able to move from this life into an eternity with God, called for the ultimate sacrifice. And every sacrifice from the one in the garden, which is the first one, through the history of, of man, from, you know, because that was the big issue when you get to chapter 4 with Abel and Cain. Cain's bringing an offering, but it's not acceptable to God. So that means that Cain knew the right kind of offering he was supposed to bring. Abel brings a, an offering that requires the killing of a lamb. Abel's is accepted God, and, and Cain's is rejected. Cain gets torqued because he doesn't get to come on his own terms. And he's even more mad at his brother because his brother is coming on the terms of God. And he's being obedient. And he feels like his brother's making him look bad. Well, he's the one making himself look bad. And again, you guys, that's going to be the issue with everybody around us. 
They're going to think we're making them look bad. Honestly, they think we make them look bad before God. And it's not really that. It's that they make themselves look bad to God. When they insist on their desires being fulfilled rather than obedience to God, well, you have to take the consequence that comes with that. We see that God made skins to cover them. They tried to cover with fig leaves. Fig leaves, from what I understand, and I don't think I've ever actually held one, but they're kind of prickly. They're an irritant. If you grab them and you rub them the wrong way, it's kind of like a, a, a nettle. Now, I've heard people say that. This is a fig leaf from the Garden of Eden. I don't know that it has anything irritating about it yet. But it was an insufficient cover. They weren't. If they had been able to cover themselves with the plants, they wouldn't have had to hide because they knew they were naked. Evidently, they were still trying to figure out how to not be exposed, and, and yet their sin is exposed in the hiding from God. So if you're running from God, your sin is already exposed. Somebody who running, who's running from the law, they know they're guilty, and other people know they're guilty. And so they run from the law. They try to hide in hopes that the the the, the uh, law enforcement won't find them. Well, Adam did that. Adam sinned. Eve sinned. Their eyes are open as soon as they eat from the fr from the tree. And then they hear the voice of God. They hear the footsteps coming, and they go and they hide. And God doesn't call out to them to because he doesn't really know where they're at. Hey, where are you? He doesn't say that because he doesn't know where they're at. He says that because he wants them to begin to confess their sin. He starts right away with trying to establish the relationship again, reestablish the relationship. He's going to let them know it's changed now. It's not what it once was. Our relationship with God is not what it could be right now. It will be one day. One day we'll be in heaven. This is all done. No more sin. No more tree of the knowledge of good and evil, just the tree of life. No more broken down body. None of that. New body, new heaven, new earth will be like him, and that's all we really know about it. People ask me, what do you think we're going to do in heaven? I don't know. Don't I, I'll know when I get there. I just know I'm going to be with him. And it's going to be way better than it is now. So, I mean, we can't even imagine. I mean, just if you really want to dwell on it, try to think of what eternity is actually going to be like. There's no time. There's no years of eternity. There's no hours of eternity. Just think about that and, and see how that makes you feel. But listen, God just... He says, Adam, where are you? And I went and I hid myself. I was naked. Who told you you were naked? Did you eat from the tree? He doesn't even give him a chance to answer the first part of the question. Just, did you eat from that tree I told you not to eat from? Like he didn't already know. And Adam, and we get we get the blame game right, right out of the box. Right? The woman you gave me, she gave it to me to eat. Because it's your fault. You gave her to me. Somebody who's so easily deceived. Now, how empty do you think those words sounded when they came out of his mouth? I mean, because really, she came from him. I mean, he was all about her when God put her in front of him. But now there's trouble. Now we're going to blame it on her. And she's actually fairly honest, I think. I mean, she'll blame the serpent, but the serpent deceived me and I ate. He doesn't even give the serpent a chance to talk. He just says, hey, listen, dude, here's your curse. You're going to be lowest of all the animals. Instead of this cunning, beautiful animal that you were, you're the lowest of all the animals now. 
you're going to crawl on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. And I'm going to put enmity between your, between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That's a prophecy of the Messiah right then. In the garden, before they're even put out. Of the virgin birth, before they're put out. That the Messiah is going to come from the woman. It's not going to come from a man. He's not going to be normal. He's going to be unique. Just like Adam is unique. Messiah is going to be unique. He says, you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise your head. He's going to crush your head. Well, the woman gets her multiplied anguish in childbearing and, and childbirth, and the man gets to work for his food now and, and till the dust of the earth and fight with the thorns and the thistles. But I want to kind of look at Romans chapter 5. And you see, now you have, you have a big problem if you throw out Genesis 1 through 3. Because it's repeated in Romans. It's, it's the whole story of how we get sin is explained by Paul here. Chapter 5 verse 12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. For until the law was in the world, but or, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not Imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who is who was to come. Adam was a type of the Messiah. Adam was a type of the Messiah, and that Adam never came from another man. Adam was formed by God. He was formed by the one who's coming after him. He's unique in that. Every other man came from a man and a woman together, except for Jesus. See, that virgin birth is important. It's essential to what we believe. Because if he's just another man, then it doesn't matter what he did. He still was born with a sin nature. He would have inherited it from Adam. But instead, God created in Mary's womb a, another seed to be able to fertilize an egg. And he took on flesh according to, to the form of a man. But he was unique. He was not the same. Adam is not his father. Verse 15 says, but the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God. And the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. So the, the, only, the only similarity is that it's available to many. Death, death is imputed. It is put on, you were born dying. And many died because of Adam's offense. But because of Jesus' grace that he's offered to everybody, well, it can go out to many. Verse 16, and the, the gift is not like that which, which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from the 
uh, from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. See, Jesus bore many offenses on him. He was rejected by men. He was brutalized. He was made to look bad. He had false accusations placed on him when he had done nothing wrong. He went through six different trials, all illegal, even according to the laws of men, illegal. And yet they held to the judgment and they judged the righteous one wrongly. And he let it happen. In their sin, they took the righteous, the righteous, the only one born righteous. In their sin, they took him and nailed him to a cross and they made him the sacrifice for us. And he allowed it to happen. He assured his disciples before it happened, nobody has the power to take my life, but I'm laying it down. I'm going to let it happen. But just so you know that nobody has the power to take my life, in three days I'm going to take it back. Verse 17 in, in Romans 5, there it says, For if by one man's offense death reigned through the, through the one, much more those who received abund, receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. But also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Now we have a choice. Do we follow our father Abraham? Or do we grab a hold of the righteousness of Jesus by grace? Do we take his grace, his gift offered to us? And again, just like Adam, just like Israel before they went into the promised land, just like everybody else through the entirety of human history, we have set in front of us life and death. We can stay in the death of Adam. We can stay in the condemnation that came through Adam's sin and continue to sin ourselves. And we even saw that remark here. All have sinned. Verse 12. It spread to all men because all sinned. I don't know if that means that if Adam hadn't, I would have anyways. But the reality of it is, is Adam did, so have I. So have you. Everybody has sinned. Everybody coming into this world except for Jesus Christ has sinned. Every single person. Nobody's been able to fix or undo what Adam did. We can't afford to reject Jesus. He's standing there. I paid the price. It's here. All you got to do is take it. It's here. Now you can choose sin, and sin will feel good. There's all kinds of things listed in the Bible what sin is. And, and in a nutshell, it is anything that does not measure up to the righteousness of God, to the holiness of God. And maybe that's what we need to look at next couple of days. What is righteousness? What is holiness? Because the church has forgotten what it is. In an effort to reach the world, we have made ourselves look like the world. We think they'll buddy up to us if we do that. But when do we tell them the truth if we do that? When do we tell them the truth that you're still lost? Just because I look like you doesn't mean I am like you. You're still lost. How do we go and participate 
in what is unholy and unrighteous before God in the name of reaching out to people who are there. It's never been a part of God's plan. In fact, his instructions to Israel were, don't do that. Don't be like the nations who are going to be around you. Don't embrace their gods. Don't act like them. Don't eat the food that they eat. Don't. Be obedient to me. Stay with me. And if you do that, I will make you a light of righteousness to the rest of the world. To the Gentiles. You'll reach the Gentiles if you'll obey me. And I think it's the same thing for us, guys. If we will obey God, if we'll walk in his, in obedience to him, and we talked about this last Friday in re, in talking about a personal revival, that it'll start with God's word and our desire to get into it and begin to learn it, and then that'll turn into worshiping God with a right heart, with a right mind toward him, and it will cause us to walk in obedience to him. And then everybody else is going to see that. And we'll be what we're supposed to be. We'll be the light. We'll be the city on a hill. We'll be a light that nobody can put out. We'll be the salt that brings flavor into the world, the real flavor, the preservative of the world. We can embrace that, and we can really honestly embrace the righteousness of God and the holiness of God and seek after that in spite of everything that goes on around us. And we will reach, actually relatively few, but we will reach people. Now we know, and if the days are short, like I believe they are, like we also looked at on Friday talking about revival, the, the days are short, the night is far spent. We've been looking at it on Sunday mornings, that he's coming soon. When you begin to see all of these things happen, know that it's near even at the door. And what we know is it'll be like it was in the days of Noah. And when we look at the description of the days of Noah, we're already there. Every thought of man is continually evil. And we have to wrestle with that. And we have to fight it. And if we, if we don't understand that, then we lose that battle too. We, if we don't, understand that the days are going to get worse and worse. The Bible says there's going to be a great falling away. And what I hope for is a personal revival, a wake up to be ready to reach as many as we possibly can before that day that the church is called out. But judgment is coming. It's coming. And, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of opposition to that. You have people who think you're going to live through the tribulation. You have people who think we're in the tribulation time right now. And if that's true, then God really overemphasized what he was going to do. But there, th there are people who think that the second coming of Jesus, all the things, all the signs, all the prophecies about it are all allegory. And that the church is going to overcome the world and that will usher in the coming of Jesus Christ. When we get it set up for him the right way, then he'll come. That we can achieve some kind of perfection. And that'll help us to overcome the world. And it's not going to happen. We're to be faithful. But the judgment's still coming. We're to hope for a revival, and to be honest with you, I think the harvest will come after after the rapture and, and after the seven years starts. We'll see. When you read through Revelation, you see thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people who come to the Lord. And when the Antichrist goes against Israel and can't touch him, he turns, it says, on the saints, and he begins to kill them. 
To be a believer in Jesus in that last seven year period will mean to lose your head. They're going to, I mean, talk about being tough and talk about being determined and choosing life rather than death. It'll look like they're choosing death, but they're not. They're choosing life. Every brother and sister we have now, today, that chooses to not deny Jesus Christ, whether it's in the face of a gun or a, or, or a sword or whatever it is, and many are put to death even today, every time they choose life. They're not choosing death. They're choosing life. They understand that Jesus said, I'm coming to get you. They understand that, that Paul said, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. What can man do to me? If God is for me, who can be against me, really? And this idea that we have, that we're just going to make everything right and Jesus is going to come and that's all allegory. Um, First of all, you, you look at his first coming and all of the prophecies that pointed to his first coming and they were fulfilled. To the letter, they were fulfilled. What would in the world would make us think that all of the prophecies concerning his second coming are just stories? That doesn't make any sense. That makes no sense at all. We have to choose life. Or we can choose death. All of the sacrifices from the one in the garden to the ones that are explained in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and, and Exodus, all of those, all of those that are explained, all pointed to the Messiah. They all pointed to innocent blood being shed to cover sin. And it's his work on the cross. He had to die for us. If he didn't, then there's no choosing life. It's only death. We're stuck with Adam's curse. And we're stuck without a choice. And we see that he died for, for all. He paid a price big enough to pay for everybody. And there are some out there who teach, oh, no, he only died for those who are going to be saved. Well, only those who are going to be saved are embracing the, the, the gift. But it says he died for everybody. And Jesus said, everybody that God's given me, everybody the Father's given me, I haven't lost a single one of them. But then he turned right around and said, everybody who will come to me, I will in no way turn away. And again, in Romans, it's going to tell us that <clears throat> all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. You say, well, Glenn, you already talked about <clears throat> predestination and, and you, you know there's things about the election in the Bible. Yep, there are. I'm not going to deny that. Well, you know, that's not fair if it's an election thing, if it's predestination. That's not fair. God's picking and choosing. Well, then, accept this free gift of grace then. Call on the name of the Lord and be saved. Well, I don't want to do that. Well, then you're not part of the elect. You're not part of the chosen. Well, that's not fair. It, we can argue a circle all day long if you want to, but it is what it is. You have a choice. Let's just argue it from this side. You have a choice. Choose God or reject God. Choose life or choose death.
And if you choose life, that doesn't make life easy. You're going to wrestle with the old man for the rest of the time you're here. You're going to wrestle with the desire that will bring sin and bring death. You're going to wrestle with sin. God's going to, some of it he'll take and he'll take right now. And some of it you're going to have there just to remember who you were. Paul, he wouldn't say I, I, that he wrestled with it. He admitted, the Apostle Paul, the great Apostle Paul who wrote more books of the Bible than anybody else, said, I don't do what I want to do, and I do what I don't want to do. And I don't get it. Even he wrestled with it to the end of his life. But he makes a statement here in, in chapter 6, verse 1. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in a newness of life. You die to your old self. When you embrace Jesus Christ, when you take his salvation, you die to yourself. You're supposed to walk in a newness of life. It is different. It should be a different perspective, a different outlook on life. We're supposed to crucify the old man. Verse 8 says, Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. He didn't die again. When Lazarus was raised from the dead, Lazarus had to die again. Everybody that Jesus raised from the dead in that three and a half years of his ministry died again. Everybody but him. When he walked out of the tomb after three days, he never died again. When we are resurrected from the dead or caught up in the rapture, we never die. We don't die again. We're not separated from him again. He defeated sin on the cross. That's why he had to die. He defeated death in the grave when he came out of the grave on the third day. That's why he had to come back. And there's not another religious leader, religious system that has that. Not a single one. We don't have to appease God. We just have to embrace God. The sacrifice has been made. The payment's been made. He made it. On the cross, he said, to tell us die. It is finished, paid in full. It was done on the cross, that three hours of, of darkness. He experienced the wrath of God. We don't have to do that. He took what we deserve. Now we get something we didn't earn. Grace. It's unearned favor of God. We get to have that. All you have to do is, is ask. You ask. Then we get his mercy. We don't get what we do deserve. That's mercy. His grace, his, his, his peace, we get his peace. That in spite of everything that goes on around us, we, we have an assurance that we know who we belong to. We know where we're going to end up in no matter what. I 
don't even know what else to say. Read John chapter 3. Jesus talks about it there. He talks about being born again. You have to be born again. Kind of chastises Nicodemus a little bit because Nicodemus should know. He says he didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, which means the world is already condemned. It was already condemned. And if you read the whole chapter, you find that out. The world's already condemned. John chapter 3. We can begin to walk like Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit in spite of everything that goes on around us. We can, we can, we can walk in a newness of life. We can live a new life. Our attitudes can be different. We're going to wrestle with them day to day. All you got to do is get in your car and go out and drive and you'll wrestle with them. Your attitudes will come back. Try to raise kids. The attitudes will be there. You, your rebellion will come up because you're dealing with theirs. But if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John. That was written to a church wasn't written to a bunch of unbelievers. It was written to a church, a reminder that if we will confess our sin, and, and I think with the intention of convey that to everybody else too, if we will confess our sin, he is faithful. He promised he would do it, and he will. He's faithful and just. In other words, he is justified to forgive us of our sin. He's justified because he paid the price. There has to be, had to be a price for sin. There had to be a consequence. An ultimate eternal consequence. There had to be a consequence. He would not be just, still a just God, if he just let everybody in without paying the consequence, without accepting the gift. He still he would not be just anymore. He would not be holy if he let anybody just come in. Unclean, defiled, still, yeah, come on into heaven anyways. He wouldn't be a holy God. There had to be a price paid to be justified. Jesus paid the price. He justifies us. By his justice, he can give that away. Now, the price has been paid. He can make us clean. And he can make us clean. Now, we can be holy. Now, we can have a relationship with God. Now, we can enter into his rest. Now, we can enter into his peace. Now, we can enter into his joy. Because he has made us holy. He, he in other places... In Ephesians talks about seeing us already seated in the heavenlies. He sees us to the end. He sees us complete. He loves us that much that if we truly accept him and we really confess our sin, we really, as again in Romans says, if we will confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe... In our heart that God raised him from the dead will be saved. If you do that, he's made it so you can't screw it up again. He loves you that much. And that's what it takes. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Call on the name of the Lord. I don't care where you're at. I don't care what you've done. He paid the price. He took on the wrath of God. It's not just about nails and thorns and spears and crosses. It's about the wrath of God being poured out on him. And he took it. And he paid it. And at the end of it, he said, it's finished. You need to know Jesus is your Lord and Savior. 
He is the only one who has died for you, who decided to do it before you were born, before you were made. He loved you that much. He is the only one willing to take on the wrath of God for you. Read Ephesians chapter 1. He is an inheritance for us, but he also sees us as his inheritance, which means he sees value in you. So whatever the world's convinced you of, you've gone too far, you're worthless, God could never love you, it's all a lie. He knows you, and he's calling to you, and you need to respond to that. Don't wait. He sees value in you, whether you do or not. Trust him with that. You are worth enough to go to the cross and die and take on the wrath of God. And three days later to come out of the tomb. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word. Lord, thank you for covering our sin, for paying the price for us, for shedding your blood, and being that ultimate sacrifice. Father, for ripping that veil in two so that we have access to you. Lord, it's my hope that this was clear and understandable. Lord, I pray that there are those out there who are maybe hearing this for the first time and and Lord, I pray that you would speak to their heart, that you would make it clear to them. That they would know that you loved them enough to come and to die. And that right now they are making that decision to follow you for the rest of their life. Lord, your word says when somebody makes that choice, that decision, that all of heaven rejoices. And we do too. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.